of the three major movements that took Hanukkah, not only did they reinterpret Hanukkah, but they made Hanukkah the banner for who they are as attempts to defend the Jewish people and to bring the Jewish people's success. The first one, of course, is historically secular Zionism. The next one is, probably historically, Reform and conservative Judaism in America that took Hanukkah as a very central expression of what they did. And what's the third? The third group of Jews who identified Hanukkah as their holiday? Chabad. Chabad, who of course created their own, a totally different performance. Nowhere in the Rambam are you going to find that it's a mitzvah to put a Hanukkah on the White House lawn, right? <laughs> But everybody has to change the performances, the symbolics, at the same time as you do the dress up. So I'd like to start, however, with a picture. Some of you picked it up. I'm not sure everybody did. Oh, everybody picked up this picture at some time. It was, it was out there at the very beginning. If you didn't, I'll pass out some of them. And I want to look at one of these pictures. Actually, not the one right here, which I love. And what else did you get? Okay. Anybody didn't get a copy? Have any of you ever drunk? Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to ignore the beer one, which I think is a terrific one, good for America. I want you to turn over to the other page and look at this one from Germany. So, in the Jewish and Israeli schools, they call this Midrash Tuna. Can you do a Midrashic interpretation of what this, how this picture could be interpreted? I'm not interested in history, I'm interested in your interpretation. What does it stand for? I'll follow it. It's, it stands for defiance. Mm -hmm. In the face of uh, what was going on at that time. Mm -hmm. Good, right, good start. Defiance. Somebody else want to point out other details here? It seems to me like by Yemen Hahim Bazman has that kind of a thing. What was going on at that time? And what was really going on at that time? Mm -hmm. Now, did you see him? This person, Bayami Mahim, ends with the Nisim and the Nilchamot and the wars. And so you see the person putting the candle, not just remembering them, but trying to apply them to his, his situation. Good. What else? Pay attention, by the way, to physically what you see here as well. Mm -hmm. The candles are not lit, it's a staged photograph, and it's in the German archive, the Prussian archive. So I don't know what's going on, but somebody's creating propaganda. Uh -huh. well. <laughs> well, I, actually, I know something about the history of the picture, so I'll give you that afterwards, okay? okay. Definitely somebody's doing propaganda. What is propaganda? To propagate. What's to propagate? Like to propagate light? Pure soup. Pure soup. So one of the things is, this is pure soup, I don't know if it's the nest, but it's pure soup. And that's exactly what it's supposed to be. So it fits in very nicely with the halakha here, right? So let's quick reminder. What else do you see here? Spatially, go ahead. I see if the, if the candles were lit within the image of the Hanukkah as well as within our soul at the time that the Nazi flag would burn itself away and people would survive. Mm -hmm. So you're turning it into a story, a narrative of what you can imagine the effect of that light will be. It's not just sending out a light. For you, it's sending out a flame in order to destroy that Nazi flag. Very interesting. Yes, Michelle. The Sanukiah takes up a lot more space. It's a lot more clear. Yes. And yes. the swastika is fading. Good. Now do a spatial analysis. Where are we? Where's the picture being taken We're from? We're inside the house. We're inside the house, looking through the window onto the public square. Right? One of the key elements, and one of the key elements of the mitzvah of Hanukkah is Pirsum Hanex, right? Where's the candelabra? Of course, they didn't have a, a menorah or a Hanukkiah in those days. And Jews weren't even supposed to make anything that looked like a menorah because that was only in the temple. You only start getting menorahs in synagogues from the 1500s, right? So whatever, he already has a menorah in his house. Where do you put the menorah, traditionally? The window. The window. The window. By the door. By the door, right? One side of the mezuzah, the other side the door. And the other one, secondarily, is to put it in the window. So it could be seen from the outside. Right? The key element then is, and here we'll lose a nice... A nice uh, term, a Greek term, which is now very popular in anthropological <coughs> literature. This is a liminal event. Liminos means the doorstep. 
It is the meeting point between the inside and the outside in which the inside is broadcasting, propagating with the power of light some kind of a message that's going out to the larger world. And because of what's happening in the larger world here, that is, the public, the public election of the Nazis, therefore it's also a challenge to the outside world. It doesn't have to be in opposition, but there is a tension clearly between home and the public space, which is important. And of course that fits in with the halachot. What do we know, what are the halachot about Kirsum Hanes? If the place is you in danger, it's, it's not obligatory. Right, the Ashkenazim use that as a big excuse, right? In Babylonia, <laughs> When the Jews were, uh, during, the, uh, during the Talmudic period, under the Zoroastrians who were fire worshippers, they didn't like the Jews playing around with fire, and therefore the Jews had to hide the fact that they were lighting candles, and therefore they allowed themselves, only under duress, shot sakana inside the house, and then who are they doing the pirsum for? Who are they advertising to? It's an internal educational process, but they've given up on the notion of educating the outside world because it's dangerous. That's what makes this picture so powerful. He didn't follow that halacha, did he? Was patur, not assumed. Huh? Uh, that's actually a question on the Rambam about whether you can put yourself in danger for anything except the three mitzvot, right? Rambam says you're not supposed to to be a martyr for any mitzvah except for the three, although Bishat Hashmad will leave out the martyrdom. That's too complicated halakhically for me at this hour. I don't, I don't eat until afterwards. But, yeah, that's it. I, but this guy is saying, I am going to put it in the window, and I'm not looking for excuses to hide my identity from the public realm, even though it's extremely dangerous. What else halakhically are the laws of Pirsum? Supposed to do it at dusk when people are coming home from work. Right. Not, according to the Rambam, it's not seta kochavim, it's not when the, the candles, but you're supposed to do it from the moment of the shkia, because that's when people are outside. Assuming you don't have electric lights, people are all going to be coming home at dark at that hour, and then you're supposed to publicize. And it would appear, therefore, that the publication is not only to Jews, but to non Jews, to anybody who's in the outside world. Therefore, how long does a Hanukkah candle have to burn for? So we can now. For half an hour, and of course the half hour in halacha changes according to the length of the day. This is the shortest day, so the half hour is going to be really a short period of time. And what are you not allowed to do with that candlelight while you are allowed to do with the Shabbat candles? You are allowed to, in fact, the mitzvah is to have onik Shabbat, which is created by putting your Shabbat candles, which should last three or four hours, near the table, because Shabbat candles are just another name for light. It's like leave your electric light on for three hours at least so you can enjoy your food, have shalom, buy it, etc. But the Hanukkah candles are... Only for Prisumanes. Only for Prisumanes. Now how do you know the difference since you see a candle in the era in which candles were the source of light? How do you know whether the candle is for light or the candle is symbolic? <laughs> it's in the window or the door. Hmm? If it's in the window or the door. Right, if it's going to be in the window or the door, but why? You don't have a, you don't have a light out by your door for guests coming over. Right? But I don't usually sit and read by it. Uh, right, but you're actually not. Well, uh, by the one by the window. Door. Right, right. What has to be clear is its holiness in some way has to make it different from something that's being used. Therefore, what candle did the Rabbanim add? The shamash. The purpose of the shamash is not to light the other candles. You can actually light one Hanukkah candle from another candle. It's the light you can use so you can read my Hanukkah book and you can read the book. I made it really big print, but you're still using the light in some kind of a way. So, so the key yeah, the shamash is actually what allows you to distinguish. Now when you're outside in Los Angeles and you see lights on at night in Los Angeles, how do you know if they're for advertising purposes or they're for use purposes? <coughs> if the design says something. If it says Bank of America, you know that's not because they're concerned about the lighting problems on the street. Uh -huh. right, but that, but it's a classic form of advertising. Now what you're advertising is the question. I think this is one of the most important things for us to clarify for ourselves as individuals and as a community. I don't have the answer, but I have the question. The question is, how do we take our values which we live in the home, 
course, you can broaden it to the home community or in the synagogue. And how do you witness to them, nice Christian word, a dupe, shahid, right? How do you witness them towards the outside world and say, these are the values I believe in? Maybe even these are the values I want to convince you to give thought to, right? As when you put a sign up on your lawn, if you have a lawn that says which candidate you're for, or vote for or against proposition, whatever it might be, it's not coercion, but it is entering the public space with a set of values. For me, one of the, the most important things is the direction of the light. I think in this case, the light begins in the home, and then you send it out to the public. For most of us, certainly for our children or grandchildren, the light comes from the outside, also by a broadcasting agency, right? NBC, whatever it might be, and the light comes into your house, and it's called your TV screen or your screens. One of the reasons Haredim don't want to have any screens in their houses, they don't want any secret messages being sent into their community. They want to close that off. This is not about ghettoization of Jewish values. You're participating in the public world, but we want to make sure that the home values are strong enough that they can send something out and, and influence the public square in some kind of way. And not only what often happens, which is the tyranny of the majority and the pressure of the Christmas lights or whatever other kind of lights are the public square lights. Now, my father told me a story, I think, that indicates that does this very nicely. My father, a conservative rabbi, he went in 1963 to a conference of conservative rabbis, and there was a small committee there that was talking about how do we recall the memory of the Hasidim Motalam, the righteous Gentiles who saved Europe during the Holocaust. So while they're having this meeting about how to commemorate the righteous Gentiles, I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, it was Everett Gendler who was there. And he said, what are we talking about this when Martin Luther King is in Birmingham? Right? If you want to show your responsiveness to righteous Gentiles, then isn't it our job to go out and to be there? So they got the rabbis together. The whole rabbinical assembly made a decision that they were publicly sending a, uh, a group of rabbis. 19 rabbis volunteered. My father was one of them. They went to Birmingham for three or four days. And uh, I found the sermon that my father gave on that occasion after he passed away about a year and a half ago. I'd never heard my father's sermons that way. And in it, he talked about a button, which I, we found in his, in his uh, the things he had. And the button said, I believe in human dignity. And my father was always like, loved to talk to young people and to provoke them. So he went up and he saw that button. In fact, he writes that he wanted to buy that button for his children, though he never gave it to us. And he went up to one of the high school kids, and of course, the kids were very much involved. All the kids in Birmingham had gone through training not only in nonviolent uh, uh, non opposition to the law, but also to prepare themselves to go to prison. And they thought it was a great honor to go to prison. So he said, can I buy one of those buttons? And the high school kid says to him, well, do you believe in human dignity? My father said, I'm not sure if I do or not, right? And so the kid says, well, if you don't believe in human dignity, you can't buy a button. If you're going to say that I'm a Jew representing values, you have to live those values. Otherwise, don't walk around with those values on your lapel as if those were values that were really important to you. That's really just now. One of the interesting things I found is that when you look at Sefer HaMakabim, there is, of course, no source in the book of Maccabees, which was written approximately 140 BCE, just to get the quick dates, would that be helpful for people? Right? 169 BCE, you have Antiochus IV coming into Jerusalem, ripping off all the gold in the temple to pay some debts that he owed to the Romans, including the menorah disappears at that time. In 167, according, depends on who you read, in 167 BCE, you have, um, you have the Hellenist high priest in turning Jerusalem from Jerusalem into Antioch, changing the constitution of Jerusalem from the Torah as the legal constitution, which it had been since Ezra at least and making instead a democratic constitution, whatever the constitution of the Greek cities were, and that's why they called it Antioch. At the same time, you begin with the transformation of the temple into a more Hellenist rite, and this is, in, and this is when they put the statue of Zeus into the temple, 
and they begin the persecution of those Jews who didn't go along with the Hellenization. Now, one of the things I noticed that I hadn't noticed before when I started looking is that it's not only that they persecuted Jews and prohibited their public celebrations of Judaism by tearing up Sifre Torah and putting the, uh, the Pesel, the statue of Zeus, and by taking the Mizbeach and, and uh, burning uh, hogs on top of it, but they also went after the home Judaism. They did it by going after women who allowed their children to be circumcised. There's an awful description of women who had a child circumcised, that they would take them, put the child around the women's necks, and push them off the wall to die. There was, of course, there are other stories about the martyrs who refused uh, to eat tray food. It wasn't tray, but tame food, impure food. And um, they also required the Jews to burn incense on the doorsteps of their houses. Which I understand as being that your private self has to reflect the values which are the public values. Now I've never seen anybody make a direct connection between that and the rabbinic decision to put the Hanukkah menorah next to the threshold. But I think the notion really re resounds in a powerful kind of a way. It's also important that the revolt of the Maccabees was led by one family, Matityahu and his five sons. And when son number one was killed, son number two took over, then three, then four. Luckily, he had a lot of kids. But it was one family's power that ultimately generated, of course, the much larger movement. And so I think that the issue of family is at the very center of what Hanukkah is celebrating, not merely remaining as family Judaism, but a family that begins, therefore, to influence the public square in one way or another. Okay, time for a little chavruta, short chavruta. Take out your text. Let's look at the very first text. Let's look at Matityahu, as Matityahu is portrayed in Sefer Maccabi, the first Sefer Maccabi. By the way, all of this material is in the second Hanukkah book, first Hanukkah book. Anybody still interested in these books, that they can be had, because they're almost out of print. Anyway, all the material, that's where it comes from. So if you've already read it at home, you can leave now because you're already in the Or you may want to be reminded of it and learn something new anyway. So look on page one. I'd like you in a chavruta with the person next to you, as small as you can, to go through the story in which I'm asking you to do several things. First of all, what is the picture of the situation as seen through the writers of Sefer Maccabin. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? What's the fight all about? What are the virtues? What are the ideal traits that we want in our heroic figure? And last, uh, what allusions do we find to earlier models, for example, in the Tanakh, that might help us see how they're building this in a midrashic way on earlier sources from 